Yeah. There you go. Here comes one of our speakers down the aisle. He's coming down the aisle. Bill's talking in the back. Bill, get up, get up here. So this is kind of our afterglow session for the hardcore people. Yeah, you're up on the stage with a mic. You can get right, the right or left. It's your opportunity to choose. Oh, no, no, no. The, the two mics. Oh, the microphones, yeah. Right. That way, you know, you, you know something just stand behind with the microphone. Bill. He's paying me back for all my interruptions over the years. My bad karma is coming home to roost. <laughs> of course not. That's why it's coming home to roost. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Bill. Bobby, always a pleasure. Yes. <laughs> Take your position. All right. Up there. All right. Great. High and lifted up. All right. Okay. <laughs> Questions for from the audience. Anybody have a question? Okay. Either go to the, we're going to start with Hal back at the far microphone back there. You can go back there or go over here. This is just for front people. Okay, to the uh, <clears throat> last speaker, um, a lot of conservatives put a lot of uh, stock in owning gold in their portfolio. And you uh, very definitely said, uh, don't depend on gold. Uh, so would you address that? Yeah, that's, uh, that's almost a religious topic, isn't it, gold? <laughs> um, I don't mean to be facetious, but there certainly are a lot of people that do believe gold is God's money. But I think the Bible, um, I'll, I'll give you a biblical perspective. Um, there's sort of five roles that gold have. You know, we have the old traditional role where gold was a valuation measure. So thousands of years ago, up until uh, several hundred years ago. Um, and then there's a second one, which is more of a last day role, I call it. Um, which is where now, we're in, we're in a period of time where uh, the world is now a closed system, really, a financial system. And gold really has a very, 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 very small role in the financial affairs of the world today. It's less than half a percent of the value of uh, all financial securities in the world. Um, so it's a good investment from time to time, but it's not a preserve of value. I would not look at it that way. Um, there's going to be some other roles that will be a little better. I talked about, no, I don't know if I did, um, but uh, the tribulation period gold has another role. Of course, it's worth nothing at one point. And then gold, again, has a very wonderful role in the, in the, in the, uh, new, in the millennial period. But so for now, we're in this fiat money system uh, where everything is corrupt and, and, and quite deceiving. And there will be times where gold's a good buy. Uh, Gary North called me... Uh, he called me a Christian hating, no, pardon me, gold hating Christian. Uh, apparently, that's an oxymoron. Um, because I didn't believe that gold was God's money, basically. I would just look at it as, as that. Gold is a lot cheaper now than it was before. And uh, as an investment manager, portfolio manager, I, I would probably be interested in looking at it sometime soon. But that's all it is it's just an investment, short term investment. I believe your comment was that it won't have any value during the tribulation, the last... At one point. Yeah, the last three and a half years. Uh, and things. Go ahead. Bill, question for you. One second after the book, how real is that threat? Are they on Capitol Hill concerned about that threat? Uh, obviously, with these countries with short-range missiles, ICBMs, nuclear weapons, and things like that, you alluded to the EM... Uh, threat and, and how it would throw us back to like 1900 or something. But well, you know, I've, I've been at the uh, the briefing of these uh, former CIA director James Woolsey, uh, Clark Lopez, um, P. 
people that have worked in the Middle East, um, uh, and they have been saying for the last six or seven years that we need to reinforce our power grids because we are very, that's our Achilles heel. And at that time, uh, five, six years ago, it was five to seven billion dollars. And, and we have squandered many, many more billion than five to seven billion. I don't think there's a better investment than reinforcing our power grid. And it just, I just can't believe anything has been done. I mean, we're six, six years into this and nothing has been done. Maybe the Republicans on the Hill will do something, but we need to reinforce our power grid because this, if an electromagnetic pulse was set off here and fry all our transistors, we would be back on, it would be a horse and buggy stage, and 90% of America would not survive 12 months. So with that said, I mean, how foolish. I mean, this is a number one national security priority and nothing has been done. Maybe it helped lower the population like that, huh? What's that? <laughs> Which, Maybe that would, it would help lower the population like yeah, that, like. Yeah. Okay. Oh, on oh, this side. Or was it there first? Okay, go ahead. Uh, fiscal question. Uh, it seems like derivatives are going to be here for, for the future. So I'm curious, what, what percentage of kind of like the world's uh, GDP is derivatives A? Or, or how is that the wrong question? Mm -hmm. Okay. But I know a little bit about it, but I'll answer um, that. That's your answer. Derivatives. Um, so I wasn't quite sure I had your question. How much do derivatives add? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a big, there's a lot of. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, there's net figures and there's gross figures. Uh, no, we have all the exposures. But. Um, would you define derivatives for? Uh, yeah, derivative is a, a type of financial instrument, and there's quite a number of them. There's an endless number of them that, that derive, in other words, their value from another underlying security, maybe an equity market, maybe a, a bond, maybe a future interest payment, and, and they'll put contracts on these, so you sort of have securities on top of securities, if you will. And that number I had showed in my um, my presentation, which showed the financial position value of all listed securities, including derivatives, was 13 times world GDP. So um, it, it doesn't add much. It adds, it adds a fair bit of instability at times. I would say that's about the only thing. Yeah, and financial derivatives is something that's been watched for the last 14 to 16 years. There's a great concern about the derivatives long-term capital management in like 98, 99, when that was a five or six billion dollar hit, that was a derivatives hit as far as I know. And then the uh, subprime fiasco, uh, that was another major, major financial derivative hit. And basically it's, uh, we can use jet fuel for example. Southwest Airlines bet that the price of jet fuel is going to continue to stay high, so they hedge that. And there's other airlines, in, in many cases, they didn't have cash to do it, but it's a form of hedging to protect the big swings in a commodity. And you have people on both sides of the bet. If, uh, if there's big swings, there's big losses, which happened with the subprime uh, derivatives issue. Uh, I think the notional value is now like 600, 700 trillion. And that's what you're alluding to, is like 13 times the world's GDP. Uh, these, at one time, uh, uh, Warren Buffett called these are uh, financial weapons of mass destruction or something of that of that nature. But now he's a big player in the market, so I guess maybe he's figured out how to, how to manipulate it. But you know, these uh, ninety percent of the derivative trading in America is with our major banks, uh, our major four banks. So there's a tremendous amount of exposure. As long as there's not the big swings in commodities or, or things that they bet on, that's fine. But if one day again that we have some big swings, there's going to be some other massive future losses. I mean, my understanding is that they don't make so much money off the derivatives, and that's why the number's so big. But the number's so big, I mean, it's like, is it really worth it? I guess it is, because they're there. But it just, I still ask, is it really worth it? Yeah, because it pays commissions. And there's a large financial, there's large financial institutions that have enormous number of people coming up with these things inventively and do a good job of selling them. Yeah. So my question for Wilfred is, um, 
you know, in 08 when the market turned down and so many, I think, middle class investors lost a lot and maybe some of them are still on the sidelines. I don't know. But I read a lot of uh, commentaries on the stock market. I'm not a long term hold guy, but more of a trade in trends. And so you, you mentioned something that we kind of struck a nerve with something I read recently about you know, the population growth decline. And one of the predictions was that in a cyclical fashion that they were, you know, predicting the next market downturn to be within the next year because of a certain, um, I don't know if it wasn't the boomers, maybe the millennials were hitting a certain age group uh, where they start spending the least and saving the most. And they, so that's yep. when they were saying, hey, it's, it's about time to, you know, remove it. And I guess my question is, is that feasible, one? And secondly, it seems like the only people who really suffer are the middle class investors because, you know, we know that the traders make money going down just as well as, you know, yeah. shorts and puts mm -hmm. as they do going up. Yeah. Well, some of those things that you mentioned, particularly about the aging phenomenon, that's already had an impact on financial markets for some time. And I guess to the second part of your question as to when the next downturn would come, um, I, that's something that's as extremely difficult to predict and I don't really try to. I do try to look at risks and that type of thing. But you know, as I mentioned also in the presentation, we're, we're in an environment where it, it's completely unorthodox, it's unprecedented. The things that are happening today uh, have no benchmark. Uh, so it's very difficult to make those kinds of predictions. People are willingly playing the game. There's a lot of incentive people on Wall Street and everywhere else that you know, have their poker in the fire. They, they want this thing to perpetuate as long as possible, and they're all in complicity, if you will. Not all, but the, the, the institutions are. So it's a hard one, uh, as I say, there are no benchmarks. This uh, Federal Reserve money printing has profited, American people have profited from it. Uh, I heard uh, Nina Easton on Fox one night, and uh, she's with Forbes magazine, and says this, Quantitative easing has put a tremendous amount of money in the bank's pockets and a small group of individuals. And that's really the way it is. A lot of the people in the middle class uh, got burned really bad last time around. And a lot of them didn't participate you know, in the markets. Uh, the, the other thing is every time Obama says he is concerned about the middle, the middle class, I think of the fact he's trying to destroy the middle class. That's the way it is, because his policies are harmfully, uh, greatly harming the middle class. And this is a, a really shame. And it's going to continue. Yes. Yeah. As I said, there is no free money. Um, all that's happening is, 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 a, is an organized transfer of wealth. Uh, Very well policies are put in. Uh, my question's for Bill. Uh, in view of the recent national election, and in view of the things that we've talked about today, how would you categorize uh, Mitch McConnell, the Senate, and John Boehner and the House? Well, they, they don't have a history of being really strong and tough. Uh, however, Mitch McConnell was some friends of mine in West Texas a couple of weeks ago, actually about a month and a half ago. And uh, this is a real seasoned political friend of mine. And he said, when you talk to Mitch McConnell in private or with a small group, he, he's impressive. But unfortunately, he hasn't been that impressive. So Mitch McConnell, it's going to be interesting to see how he uh, uh, runs the Senate as a Senate majority leader. I just wish we had stronger leadership than John Boehner and Mitch McConnell running the House and running the Senate because this is a crucial time. And Obama got away with a lot of things because of the weak leadership of the Republican Party over the last five or six years. So um, this is a very unique opportunity controlling the House and the Senate. They don't control the White House. But uh, we are hopeful and prayerful there will be some strong leadership. And this is a shellacking that just took place. Uh, this was one of the biggest defeats the Democratic Party has seen in, in decades, almost a century in, in some respects. So, you know, the, the two-party system is both at fault. Both Republicans and Democrats are at fault for the condition of our country. 
unfortunately with the Republican leadership during George W. Bush's time in office, it, our federal government increased by 50%. That's unacceptable. So a lot's riding on these guys doing a good job. Uh, Obama's going to draw his efforts and his legislation is going to push more and more people away from the Democratic Party. But the Republicans need to be careful not to walk into some of these traps like immigration and others. Uh, they need to show some compassion. However, we immigration is immigration. We have people that are in the country illegally. So, um, you know, they just have to be real careful. So we're hopeful uh, Obama will be held fully accountable until the day of his office in January 2017. Okay, well, I have one for uh, Wilford. Uh, since the Bible predicts a cashless society, you know, I'd like to know when you think we're going to move into cashless. And then uh, for Bill, related to amnesty or shamnesty, as I like to call it, um, I mean, given the fact that Obama just made up law out of thin air with these executive orders, I mean, to me, that the debate shouldn't even be about amnesty, but it's it's how how he push this through, which to me means we're almost living in a totalitarian society when you can just ignore the separation of powers. So I guess what I'm asking is what uh, is going to be done, you think, to push back against that? Or can anything be done? So, okay. We'll start. And then beyond that, my wife is going to ask a question after me. So. <laughs> well, I'll uh, hit the cashless society question. Of course, we, we all like a cashless society, I think, from a convenience point of view. It's very, very practical, very, very efficient. And so, I guess, in and of itself, a lot of these medium that we use to translate cash aren't evil or anything else like that. But I, if I was going to speculate how it would come in, you know, I think we, we already got some early glimmers of why there is a strong rationality to go to a cashless society, and that is, again, having to do with the... Uh, the impotency of the financial policies, monetary policies that are brought into effect. In, as I mentioned uh, earlier, in quite a number of parts of the world, particularly Europe, you know, for the privilege of depositing your money, you're paying money now. It's a negative interest rate. And uh, some policymakers and, and, and macroeconomic thinkers out there think that that's one of the solutions that central banks should aggressively pursue right now to pump prime these uh, economies is to go to negative interest rates, scare everybody out of deposits so they'll spend it. But uh, you can only do that if you have a closed financial system. You can't have alternate means of payment systems and that kind of thing. So you first got to have a closed, when I say closed, uh, I mean um, that there's no, no cash. And that way they can enforce uh, a negative interest rate. So that, I'm speculating, but uh, that would certainly be uh, a reason why that would come into place at some point. It's fascinating, uh, on the cash side, it's, it's the convenience uh, of just using a credit card, not carrying cash. The, the, you know, it's amazing, uh, the, the convenience of, a, of the mark, eventually. We'll have to carry uh, IDs, passport information, credit, or to just scan. I mean, it's so fascinating the way the enemy is, is bringing in this system through convenience and personal security. So uh, it's, it's an amazing dynamic. Uh, as far as the Constitution, I mean, you know, uh, Alan Dershowitz, Harvard lawyer, said it's going to be very interesting to see what happens because there's really, there's never really been a test of the executive orders, and, and you know, if they sue Obama because of the executive orders, there's, we, it's, it's, a, it's a gray area. It's an area that's never really, truly been tested, and you know, these things can go to court and it can take a long time. And, and, and it seems like Obama knows that this is an area that he can, he can pull off and he can do what he wants to do. And um, just like a lot of his policies, you don't take don't ask, don't tell back. You don't take defense and marriage back. You don't take uh, uh, same-sex marriage back. That's the evil of those policies. You can't return. I mean, you've lost that territory. It's hard to re re regather. So I think it's the same thing with, uh, with immigration. He's going to do the same thing. I think it was an 88, Reagan, when he did an am or some form of amnesty, was about 8.8 .8 million of the illegal immigrants in America. What has happened is a lot of the major banks, especially the West Coast, they, they have given the immigrants a tremendous amount of money. They, they, 
that when they've loaned the money, they've been paid back. This has been a this has been good business for them. And it's been good business for a lot of corporations that work in the in the Southwest. I mean, cheap labor, hardworking labor, uh, reliable labor. And uh, one quick example, I have a friend with Barron's Magazine, uh, it's owned by the Wall Street Journal. And he's a Catholic, and every few years he goes to Ohio and, and goes to visit a friend of his that's a priest. And he went to the church a couple years ago and he said, but you lost half your members. You know, where are they? He said, well, we had a lot of legal aliens in this church. And they were forced to leave the country. But what happened also is the companies in the area were forced to close because the white kids and the black kids could not, not pass the drug tests. And if you can't pass the drug test, you can't be insured. If you can't find the employees, you've got to close your companies, close your factories. So it's, it's a very big, huge, grandiose problem. And we let it go for a long, long time, and there's a lot of companies who are there to provide the resources to create this incentive. And, uh, and Obama, it's about votes. Everything he does is about getting votes. 46 million people receiving food, food assistance today, that's voters. Uh, 13, 14 million people coming into the U.S. illegally, that's voters. That's the way they look at this and these kind of policies. And at this point, I, I, I don't know if he can be stopped. <clears throat> or how or how will we stop? Not, not to mention they don't have to pay for their health care. But um, in 2008, the financial crisis, have you heard that that was actually a terrorist attack? I mean, have you heard that maybe some foreign bad actors were finding vulnerabilities in our system? And could that happen to us again if we made the necessary changes? There's lots of rumors, and I haven't been able to substantiate any of them. Um, what happened is, is perfectly explainable without any conspiracy theories, I think. You know, things did get very, very extreme. Uh, some of the things that Bill talked about, they just weren't sustainable. And that's one of the things about financial markets. They have that property. They can allow us to be diluted for a long time, but when it ends, it ends very quickly. And uh, there, there were a lot of uneconomic um, speculative positions built up in the world's financial system which just melted down overnight. Yeah, Kevin Friedman, who lives in this area, uh, there's out in Kelly, wrote a book about it. Uh, he's a former Wall Street guy, a real nice Christian brother, and he, he believes that it's just an enormous amount of money, the Saudis and some other uh, sovereign funds that had a tremendous amount of money were able to manipulate uh, some of the stocks. Uh, especially some of the puts and calls, some of the options, and they were able to, to have an effect in the market. It's a pretty extensive book. It's pretty uh, believable. And, uh, but a lot of it, I mean, it's, I mean it was legal. I mean, if, if, if Kevin's concept is it was illegal, that they just used a tremendous amount of money to manipulate the markets to the point that it helped lead to a crash. So, you know, it's, uh, the school's still out. Why would the Saudis want to crash with all the money they invested? To make more, to make more money. To make more money. I mean, and how would they make more money if a lot of by, them? By option trading, oh, bets, yes. option bets, <clears throat> I see. puts and calls, stuff like that. It's happening again. I got a question for Will. Yeah, I mean, Will, Will, Will is would understand it better than me, but. Uh, yeah, but it is happening again. Progressively. The same, we're going to extremes again, new, new extremes. Some of the micro trading, some of the you know Goldman Sachs and some of these big Wall Street firms able to get a trade in before other massive trades. There's a lot of shenanigans that take place in Wall Street, and uh, only the people who have enormous amounts of capital and very sophisticated technologies can take advantage of this. Uh, they talk about looking into it further. What about the Federal Reserve audit? I and mean, that was approved, and nothing happened. I mean, they went to court. The court says no. Yes, you got to show your books. Have they shown their books yet? No. The, the thing to realize as well is that, you know, financial professionals that I would know, when I talk to, um, who are in the know on, on some things, they know that the ultimate consequences are going to be terrible. They all know that. But knowing that, it breeds this short-termism culture that we have right now. When the time to make money is, you got to make it. And that's why you get some big speculative positions put in place very rapidly. So that's the kind of attitude that we have. Ultimately, it's going to end, but everybody's trying to make it before it ends. Mm -hmm. Very much behind. I got a question for Wilfred. Um, you seem to intimate that 
fiat currencies, which all the world's currencies are today, won't collapse. Yet we've seen that in Germany in the 20s, we've seen it in Zimbabwe, and we've seen it in Argentina several times. Yeah, can I'm you explain this a little bit further? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not suggesting individual countries can't collapse. Uh, that, that, that happens, I mean, we, if you look at the record of international crises, bubbles, currency crises, just over the last 30, 40 years, we've had 50. Yes, yeah, right. At least. Yeah. But I, I meant in terms of a global core financial system, that must be maintained at all costs. So what you're saying is the dollar will never collapse. Um, I won't say that. Either. Well, that's the core currency yeah. in the world. Uh, well, it is right now. Yeah. Right. Well, so so, so those, those things can change, but I'm saying the basic structure of, of a unified monetary system, financial transactional system around the world, at all costs, um, must be sustained. Uh, I, and I, at one point, more, yeah. but I think that's inside the tribulation too. Yeah. Okay, but uh, up until that time, what do we do as you know, just general people in order to manage our money properly? I mean, I understand you don't be in debt, you pay off all your things, and you save your money, you plan for retirement, you all that. I've done all that. But what do you do here going forward in the light of many, many things can go very wrong very quickly? Stock market can collapse, you know. The dollar can collapse, and lots of different things. You know, how do we, as people who are responsible and accountable to God, to manage our money properly, manage our money properly in today's world? That's that's the that's the big serious dilemma today. A lot of people um, need some information in those areas. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot you're going to be able to do about it. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of these sophisticated money managers who have uh, means of moving around money quickly and can trade may have a, may have a better ability. That's one of the problems. I, I, as part of our ministry, I don't give any investment advice. Stewardship advice, yes. But simply because anything I say five days from now may not be relevant, and I won't have an opportunity to set that straight with you. That's the kind of environment we're in. So I don't give any specific advice, but I would, you know, such as you said, uh, you have to pursue stewardship number one. And then beyond that, the only investment advice I give is be very broadly diversified and go about your life in a God-honoring way. That's all you can do. And the rest of the time, you're just going to drive yourself crazy at trying to do anything else. <laughs> a couple of questions for Wilford, but uh, sharp ones, I hope. Uh, Bitcoin has shown up in, although, whatever it is, but do you think it could be a precursor to some kind of end-time scenario for making the governments of the world kind of out of the picture and controllable by a uh, smaller few person um, entity. I, I've, I've looked into the Bitcoin. Um, it's, it's interesting. There's lots of uh, lots of currencies out there. Uh, it's, it's done the best of all of them, and even at that, it's been extremely volatile. Um, I, I, you know, there already is a prototype for a one world currency if the false prophet should decide that he needs one. Um, in the tribulation period, because I don't really think it's going to happen until then, if it is going to happen. And that is the uh, special drawing right that the IMF has. That's already been incubated since the early 1960s. And so that stands by as a one world currency, one that can everybody use. And they can put it into place pretty quickly. And the other thing to remember is, you know, we're talking political economy here. We're, we're, we're talking about... Um, all of these things, like Bitcoin and gold, they only have fungibility, they only have power if they are legislated to be allowed. We know at one point in time that uh, gold was not allowed, to, you know, was, uh, was not a public asset since before. So those are all decisions that uh, countries and leaders make. And if they decide that a Bitcoin or whatever new invention is something that doesn't fit their scheme, uh, it'll, it'll be outlawed such as gold was at one point, for practical reasons th that they thought. What do you think about regional currencies like some of the South American countries with Russia to kind of subvert the yeah, you know, all those, of the dollar? I think those are all possibilities. Um, you know, the fact is that, that we have more currencies today in the world than we had 50 years ago. We don't see any convergence on the currency side overall. Some of the things we heard today earlier from Soren uh, about what's going on in Europe. We may very well have more currencies in Europe again sometime in the future. There's talk of a pseudo and a neuro and on and on. 
I, I just don't see why the, uh, why the world needs a one-world currency. Um, it could happen, but uh, you know, I don't think it's prophesied. And uh, we have to remember, too, the, the, uh, uh, the most lucrative operation that banks have is currency trading. Uh, I know that for a fact. And um, today we trade, the last survey out of the BIS um, tabulated it at 5.4 trillion, trillion per day. It's the biggest trading um, activity in the world by far. And it's very lucrative for banks. They, they would uh, only at death's door give, give up the franchise of uh, trading currencies. So it's a very strong, uh, it's a very strong coalition. I'm in the treasurer's office of a rather large corporation. I suspect you're a customer. You don't have to tell me how much you guys charge me for. So last question then, um, just with, uh, I want to know if you've seen a good answer to what unraveling the Fed's balance sheet would look like. I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear that. Just, just I would, was wondering if you have seen anything, and everyone is, the answer is I don't know. But when they finally decide to unravel the Fed's balance sheet because they put all this, these assets into it, so at some point they would need to sell them. But no, they don't. They don't. They, don't. Nope. they just hold them. Yep, they can hold forever. Um, central banks in the Second World War, uh, the major trouble that existed at that time, pretty much got to the same kind of condition that we have today because they were buying war bonds and trying to fund war effort and so forth. They never. Uh, as a group, they never bought back any. Um, and this time around, for different reasons, I don't think they'll ever buy any back. They can just retire. It's, it's all smoke and mirrors. doesn't matter. And, and you, you, you must also know that uh, when a central bank buys government treasury bonds, as they certainly have done to the extent of over $3 trillion in, in the view of the Fed, has, right? Um, they get paid the interest rate. What do they do with the interest that they accumulate at the end of the year? They give it to the treasury. So effectively, they've reduced the national debt by buying it on the central bank's balance sheet. So it's a very wonderful magic. <laughs> Thank you both. <clears throat> Bill. Uh, with the executive order, what's to keep them from doing more executive orders? It's conjecture, conjecture but uh, it's been suggested that climate change, internet control, that sort of thing would be some of these. That's one question. The other question is, uh, the Supreme Court's going to have to take up same-sex marriage now. It's the obvious. Uh, what's your forecast on that? Uh, Joe, as far as the uh, executive orders, uh, I think, uh, you know, they brought John Podesta on, who worked with Bill Clinton. He's supposedly an uh, expert at executive orders and had a certain amount of the Constitution. And he's been there for, you mm -hmm. know, Six, I think nine or twelve months now. He's a George Soros guy. So I think they need to be. I mean, they might try and know some on global warming and on internet control. Um, you know, you you risk getting to a point where you could be impeached. And if I were in a leadership and he keeps trying to do this, even though Dershowitz talks about it, it's kind of a gray area. And in the long run, you might be successful in 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 court against the executive order because of constitutionalism and all the, the, the legal language. But I think if Obama uh, keeps this up, I mean, Schumer and some other members of this party are real happy about the fact that their party is being decimated by a guy that has used so much of his political capital to get Obama here through. Like my mother's a long-time Democrat, and she's not a fan of, of, of uh, Obama or her. And she said, six years ago, he is spending too much time and too much political capital on Obamacare where we have so many other things that need the focus. So he went for it. And his, his party got shlacked. I mean, there's only two people running for office that even asked him to come and speak for him. This is unheard of. One of them on lost. Yeah, and one of them lost in Maryland. A, a Republican was elected governor in a deep dark blue state after Obama went there and spoke for the, the, the Democrat and then in Michigan he spoke for somebody but the guy was so far ahead there's no chance of him losing 
So, Joe, I think I think they, he, there needs to be some caution. I, I don't know if there's some, but I think the, the Congress at some point needs to. I have sensed that Senator Cruz is building a case as four impeachable offenses. I think last year he had a, a list of 57 things that he had put together. It was very precise. And Dershowitz says Senator Cruz is one of the smartest, if not smartest guys you've ever had in class. And, and Ted Cruz has a constitution memorized. So, you know, he, Obama can overplay his hand, and if he has some strong leadership, then these things I, I'm not saying they're impeachable or not, but I think I would definitely approach it from that, that angle. Hey, this is ridiculous. Enough is enough. You're making a mockery of our Constitution, and you should be held accountable. Uh, as, as far as same sex marriage, um, it's going to be a swing vote, probably. And you got the, uh, you know, Kennedy. Uh, could be the deciding vote on that. You got the four Democrats uh, that are very pro same-sex marriage, they don't want to touch it. They've tried to avoid it, but it looks like it's coming back to them anyhow. So um, there's a chance that we'll get put back to the state's decision, that it's not our, and, and I think Scalia has more or less alluded to that before, it's not, it, this, this is not something we should be dealing with. This should be a state issue. So there, if they do take the case, there's a chance that it goes back to the states, because we had 33 states that said no. But we have activist judges that have made it a case. So that, I'm hopeful that they will put it back in the states where the states make their own decision. And we're losing states now. Uh, where we used to have, it was overwhelming, 33, no, but we've lost seven or eight states now. Uh, so that's, that's what it looks like, Joe, at this point. Thank you, Bob. Oh, that's loud. <laughs> Um, my question actually is also about uh, the economic collapse that you were talking about. Um, I agree with you where it makes sense that it has to go through the, uh, the second half, at least, of the tribulational period. But I was wondering about the rapture itself. I mean, we're just thinking that that would probably be America's doom. How could we, um, as a world, not have an economic collapse because of the rapture? Oh, good question. I haven't really ever thought about it through too carefully. Um, if you could tell me how many people could be raptured, I could answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to be funny. Um, Barbie? Half a million. Half a million. Um, yeah, as I said, I've never really thought through that one through very, very carefully. I suppose no money is going to disappear if that happens. America, America will be sent to its knees. I mean, if we lose 35, 40 million taxpayers, hard, work, hard working people yep. from all sure different walks of life, yep. you know, it, it could be it's devastating of that. The demand deficiency scenario. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, in anything, we have really hurt America, but we have such a small percentage of believers in Europe. Uh, they would be hurt because all of a sudden their number one economy in the United States is out of, out of the picture. So that would be a factor, but Europe would just keep ticking for the most yeah, part. Yeah, I've certainly, uh, some of our group here holds that view that it's going to be the, the, uh, the rapture that, you know, will weaken America off the world stage as the Ten Kings come to the fore and that kind of thing. So that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Bill, I have a question. Right here. You're oh, standing. sorry. <laughs> uh, have you heard the news on the new Secretary Pence? Uh, I heard his name today, but I, I don't recall. I don't know anything about him. Uh, I heard he was nominated today. Did you catch his, his name? No, not really. I was just wondering if you felt he was qualified or if you feel that there's somebody in the running who is qualified, who maybe they're overlooking. Well, like, what, are, what are you even looking like? What are they looking for in the new Secretary of you know, that's, always, that's always a good question. With the Secretary of Defense and we'll listen to Susan Rice. I mean, Susan Rice is becoming a, uh, an issue for this administration. She's Carrie's had problems with her. Hagel had problems with her. She's very smart. She's got Obama's ears. She was one of the uh, Bill Clinton foreign policy apologists. Very smart lady. Worked for McKinsey and Company, made a lot of money. Um, you know, it's going to boil down to a strong personality. The good thing is, 
it won't be addressed until after the new uh, Senate's sworn in. So I, there's some real uh, defense talks in, in the Senate. You've got to remember, Hagel only got three votes from his political party when he was nominated. I mean, most Republicans said, no way, he's not, he's not the guy, not the guy for the office. So um, I heard someone's name today, it didn't ring a bell, it was nominated today, but he better be strong because I don't think he'll get the uh, nomination otherwise. And I think the Bob administration is smart enough to, to realize that. We need a Secretary of Defense. This is going to be a very difficult year, 2015. We need something strong. Anthony Carter, Ashton yeah. Carter. Ashton Carter. Ashton Carter? Yes. Any, you know anything about him? Or? It wasn't officially nominated. He's just the top. Oh. Uh, uh, okay. Well, that's, uh, that's the name I heard, too. Well, it'll be interesting. I had a question for Bill. Um, I heard that a House committee reported out on Benghazi. Is this the committee that Trey Gowdy is leading? As far as I know, yes. And he's a, he's a prosecuting attorney, I guess. As far as yeah. But they reported out and they said basically there was nothing wrong with what happened in Ben Gowdy. Yeah, I heard that, but I, I don't have the details. But uh, that is a committee. Trey Gowdy really, I mean, he's committed. I, I can't imagine being the same committee. Uh, I heard that, but I, it's just rumored at this point. I didn't hear any specifics. Yeah, no, I heard our A House committee was reported out and said there was no problems with Ben Gossi. Well, I mean, Democratic, led, led by the Democratic No, party. I heard it was a bipartisan committee. Well, but I want to know if that, that report out was Trey Gowdy's committee or not, because no, no. I don't get that from Trey Gowdy. I think he's going to dig a lot deeper. No, into I, I haven't heard that. I wouldn't think it would be Troy. Probably the previous one. It's the previous, the previous one. one that came out. Led by the guy from California. Okay, so the trace hasn't come out yet. Right, we haven't okay. started Yeah, I didn't think so either, but, you know, I'm just, you know, you know how the government is. Yeah, Gary really seems commit, committed to it. Yeah. He's, a, he's a bulldog and right. uh, right. he's a, a okay. prosecutor, right. so, yeah, uh, hopefully he'll get to the bottom of it. Bill, are there any, uh, excuse me, any residual second amendment issues in this White House before in the uh, next election? What was that again? Any residual uh, Second Amendment uh, <coughs> issues in the next two years before the next election? Uh, I, I, don't know. I think it's safe. I think it's safe right now. You know, it's going to make a big difference having uh, uh, the Republicans in control of the Senate. And this is 55. It looks like it's going to be 55. Like Landor is going to get uh, beat today. That's 54. Is 54 uh, right now? Yeah. No, 53 now. Oh, 54. She gets it. Yeah. Or, uh, is there any beat. chance that the guy from West Virginia could switch over? <laughs> he's close. I mean, he's yeah. He, he's close. I mean, uh, his his uh, man man mansion mansion. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he, he's he's close. I mean, I think you'll see he might even vote more with Republicans, but you know, he saw another. Uh, the lady got elected in the states is a Republican, so yeah, he has no. There's no future in the Democratic Party, statewide. Especially in a coal mining state, uh, right? Obama's position in coal, so I think it'd be all right. Okay, Bill. So, who do you see as the, the Democratic uh, nominee for the next election, and how would you advise the Republicans to uh, to select or process oh, their candidate? Yeah, that's a tough. <laughs> Tough call at this point. I think that you know everybody thinks Hillary's going to be the candidate. Uh, I don't know if, if her health is going to be an issue. Some people have believed that Carl Rose said we need her full, you know, health report. We we need the whole scoop when she was basically out of out of, out of uh, office for 30 days. We need to find out exactly. Uh, one guy brought up John Kerry, and I said, well, another another couple of months as being Secretary of State, John, he's pretty much worked his way out of any possibility by his lack of any success with his uh, job as Secretary of State. He's a tough time to be Secretary of State, too. Uh, uh, on the Republican side, you know, it all boils down to who can get the money. And the Republican establishment, just like the Democratic establishment, typically picks two people that they put the money behind. Uh, a quick note here, in 2004, the money was going to be behind Giuliani and Romney. Giuliani unexpectedly got out of the race for whatever reason, and Romney couldn't get any traction with the Christians. Huckabee wins Iowa and got the Republican establishment very, very concerned. So they got behind McCain. In 2008, uh, Romney had plenty of money, was able to raise plenty of money. And it's really going to boil down, if, if I had to say it right now, who can raise 
And even Tim LaHaye and I, and I think he's right, that it's going to be a billion dollar election. So who in the Republican Party can get a commitment of a half billion dollars? Uh, uh, you know, um, Bush I and Romney. Surely not the third Bush. And I hear that, but I mean, this is, it really boils down to who can get the bus. I've had three or four people this week that are very connected politically that are determined to get Mike Huckabee as a nominee, but I don't know where he's going to get the money. I, I don't think he can get the money he needs to be. And he's a good candidate, a good potential candidate. He's doing really well financially right now. But I don't see the Republican establishment at this point giving him, raising the three to four hundred million dollars he's going to need to run. What about someone like Ben Carson? Could he? Dr. Dr. Carson is quite a guy, an amazing story, but I don't think he is vice president, maybe, or um, you know, another another uh, position within the administration. But I think his lack of experience, uh, political experience, will, will be a negative. His public approval is very positive. He's a very decent man with a great story, but I don't think he is going to be the Republican candidate. Ted Cruz. Too far, to, I like Ted Cruz a lot. The guy's got guts, but he's too far to the right. I love the fact he's far to the right, but he's too far to the right for uh, to be elected president, I believe. You know, the Republican Party has a nerdy battle between the moderates and the conservatives. The big money goes with the moderates. Carl Rove raises big bucks for the moderate candidates. The conservatives like Huckabee, Cruz, Rand Paul to a certain extent, they can't get the kind of money that they need. It's difficult for a conservative candidate to get the kind of money they need to run a good campaign on a national basis. And no independent will ever be elected. I, I just have a question about ISIS. What's the, what do you think is the, who, who uh, funds ISIS? Where do they get their money? Who's money? Well, there have been a lot of rumors. Qatar, uh, some Saudi Arabian splinter groups. Uh, they robbed the Mazul Bank and got, got away with about a half billion dollars. Uh, they're making anywhere from, uh, according to New York Times, about $2 million a day in oil revenue, uh, putting their oil out of the black market. Uh, you know, they're making tons of money, and that's what they're trying to do right now, stop the money. But th that bank robbery, that Mosul bank, put a lot of money in their pocket, plus they have some very good equipment. And uh, who knows? I mean, you know, a lot Smart of people, people running. That's right. Yeah. We've heard the Hezbollah, drug money, Hamas, drug money. Hezbollah is a very sophisticated, good strategist. Yeah, they're, they're, that's what I've heard about ISIS, and I think they, they are strategically brilliant. I mean, they've really got a plan, and they're following it. You know, they've been successful at this point. Uh, they're not the JV. No, they are. They are. And um, the, the news today was that Al Qaeda was, uh, uh, you know, talked about blowing up some planes in Europe. Uh, to be somewhat of a recruiting vehicle to get people away from ISIS and, and on to uh, and on to them. So there's there's competition now between Al Qaeda and ISIS. Uh, ISIS is so brutal that it's appalling to Al Qaeda. Which I can't even believe that. <laughs> I mean that gives you an idea. I mean, it's, but um, uh, I've been to think tank meetings in Israel, recently and other places, and. Uh, this is the who's who, as I shared tonight, the who's who of Islamic thugs from around the world are moving into this uh, playing field. They're operating in the Middle East right now. And in, uh, in, they have been in Afghanistan. Uh, right now, it's been Syria, Northern Iraq, that's where they've been playing. Uh, but Afghanistan is a great concern, too. That thing, as soon as we're out of there, that could get out of control quick. And it's starting to right now. So ISIS is going to be around for a while. And, uh, I heard one day that, you know, we might have a 1% of the world's Muslims might be considered radical. Well, 1% of 1.5 billion is a lot of people. Even if it's, even if it's a half a percent, even if it's a quarter of a percent, that's still a lot. You know? And as we all know, it doesn't take a lot of these terrorists to create a lot of havoc and get a lot of international attention. From an advertising, I had one guy who equated to the point that from an advertising dollar, one suicide bomber walking into a uh, synagogue or a restaurant or a bus or anywhere else, we have front page news throughout the world for, for days. Look at the Boston bombers, how much 
press controversy. You know, if, if we could just stop that, take that off the paper, take it out of the media completely, I think it, it could be it could have a positive impact. Well, uh, I'd like to get you to elaborate more on, excuse me, on Bill's question over here about the uh, needing a stable currency, uh, or at least what I view the aspect is. I thought what you were really saying is that you need a, a stable dollar or you need something for the Antichrist to use during the tribulation period to control the economy. Is that what you were saying rather than you couldn't really have a collapse of the uh, yeah, I was, I was referring to, to a financial system. Yes. And um, we had a related question earlier about, you know, in fact, there are currencies that collapse every now and then uh, and get resuscitated. But these, these are mostly smaller countries. Um, and um, most often, when those kinds of collapses happen, uh, you start getting foreign interest moving into these countries and you can get assets cheap and the, the, the multinational companies move in and have some great opportunities. So, aside from that sort of peripheral action in smaller currencies, the focus wouldn't be on a specific currency, but a system, international payment systems that we have right now. Um, the major countries in the world would have to save their financial institutions if there was another big crisis, such as happened uh, here in North America, as everybody knows, in 2008, 2009. Some huge powers were taken to bail out some of those, com uh, some of those companies, enormous amounts. Uh, but it was seen as absolutely necessary. And, uh, and, and Satan does need a, a monetary system working of some kind. Uh, ultimately, though, there will be some problems in the tribulation period uh, where he had, well, they will have to come up with some new solutions. But until then, we're going to have crises, um, and they often work to the advantage of the sophisticated. But in terms of a big, you know, the big global collapse that many ask about, I don't think that that's uh, something we as Christians need to worry about. Thank you. Much later. Go ahead, Patsy. I just wondered, uh, you know, during the uh, lame duck period uh, before um, January, uh, whether um, the uh, president, Barack Obama, might, uh, does he have a chance to get a lot of judges through? Um, it's, it's going to be a lot more difficult now because he needs his Senate approval. Uh, the Senate has been able to hold up a lot of his nominations, even without the Republicans being in the majority. So, no, I, I, they need, the Senate needs to approve future judicial appointments so they can stop it. Well, I thought Harry Reid I thought it was a simple majority. Simple yeah, I went for the simple majority in, in the Senate. So I can see him running a bunch through in December, right? Well, but in that case, you don't have to go through hearings? Yes. Yeah, so that, that's, I think that's the, the hearings. Okay. The, the, the close to the recess, which is uh, beneficial. Oh, well, I didn't realize that. I had another question uh, back when you were talking about the presidential future of 2017. Um, uh, or 2016, well. Uh, I wondered um, if what you thought of Scott Walker, governor of Wisconsin. I'm sorry? Scott Walker. Walker. I didn't hear his name. I think Scott Walker is a, a, is a, really, a really good guy. I think he's a, a very viable uh, candidate. I think he has a, a good future. I don't know if President's it right now. I mean, we're kind of used to having a um, uh, charismatic bowl. Uh, I think Scott has long-term potential. Paul Ryan is, is still popular. I, I don't know. I don't. I, I don't know. I, uh, um, you know, every time I hear Jeb Bush mentioned, I mean, he's, he has stature, but what people know him the Bush. Uh, Mitt Romney uh, is a very likable guy. He's a Mormon, and that, that a lot of Christians stay at home uh, during the last election. A lot of, you know, especially when it looked like he might pull off. That last week and a half, two weeks, uh, a lot of Christians said, oh, great, I won't have to ever vote for a Mormon. I won't have to vote for a Mormon, so they stayed home in Obama one. So, um, Robbie Squeaky Clean, Charles Cronkheimer said the Democrats did everything they could to, to find uh, his closet, and he doesn't have one, it didn't exist. So, uh, that's what Squeaky Clean is. And if the Democrats can't find her any, it just doesn't exist. I mean, especially Obama's team. So, uh, it's stature. Uh, is my company have a stature to, to gain the money? I don't. 
At this point, we don't think so. And, and I don't think the senators do. Uh, Rand Paul. Uh, I don't know. I think they have a tough time. Isn't Huckabee rather liberal? Is it more about Huckabee? Rather liberal. Uh, you know, some people question him. I, I think uh, one thing, he's a lot more conservative than every other candidate in the party, except for maybe Ted Cruz. Yeah, there, was some, there, was, there was some stuff that, you know, you know we're not going to find a perfect candidate. Uh, you know, there were some things that I could be, in some ways, it wasn't even fair when he was running last time. But some of the Christian conservatives were uncomfortable with Huckabee. Uh, which, okay, fine, you got John McCain. <laughs> you know, so, you know, that, that's, that's what happened. And uh, so, um, you know, I'd love to see a conservative candidate, but in our, in our world today, the way it is, uh, I, I don't think the conservative candidate will win. I wish it could. I mean, I'd love to see another Ronald Reagan, but, uh, you know, could Ronald Reagan get elected today? Yeah, maybe, but it would be tough. Well, yeah, time. <coughs> time. Especially the way the Democrats get the vote out. Romney went, this is very interesting, uh, at 4 o'clock, Romney literally, he and Paul Ryan were getting ready for a victory speech on the afternoon of the election. That's how close, they thought they had it. Republican established members were, were celebrating in Washington. They thought they had it. They were already given a potential cabinet, cabinet uh, posts or names for cabinet posts. The, the micromanagement of that election, and I have a friend that said that Republicans had attorneys in every precinct of America to make sure that there was a fraud. And they were convinced there was no fraud. But the Democrats have a way of turning out votes. They micromanage it. And, and they turned out people that the Romney campaign didn't even know existed. They were dead. <laughs> I don't even really know it that way. I know. That they, my, they literally in Ohio, the day after um, Obama was elected, they were opening campaign offices in Ohio the day I elected the first time. They have a machine and uh, ran by two Jews. David Axelrod and Flight. They did a phenomenal job. Right. Uh, well, Fred, uh, about a year ago, Germany asked for its gold back. And uh, apparently, those plans have been shelved. I, I read just recently. Is that because there isn't any? <laughs> um, I, I, would, I would believe the Germans would be pretty sure it's there. I, I'm not quite sure why they've, um, why they've decided not to push that any further right now. I didn't pick up those details. Just, just wondered if anybody was concerned about that at all. I, I've heard rumors, but again, you know, it's one of these things, there's, uh, when, when the, these sort of dispersions come up, it's so hard to prove them. Okay, last question. Just a comment. Being from the great state of Wisconsin, um, where our governor has been elected governor three times in one term, um, <laughs> Scott, Scott is a very dedicated believer. I mean, he is out in front with his faith. But within the state, and almost every news person who interviewed him, are you running for president? And it's a not stated but a very implicit process, promise to the people, I'm going nowhere for four years. Yeah. He's left himself wiggle room, but you know, but great godly guy, honestly, he was my legislature for years, and uh, maybe not enough horsepower for a, a national position like that. Yeah, I think, that's just, I think that's a wise decision too, for various reasons. Thank you all very much. Let's pray.